Okay, well, I think it is time to go ahead and get started. So welcome to NOAA Live for Kids. My name is Kayla Dokudo, and I will be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Office of Education, along with the National Sea Grant College Program, and is supported by the Woods Hole Sea Grant and the National or in the Regional Collaboration Network. If you're not familiar, NOAA is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, a federal agency dedicated to understanding and predicting changes in climate, weather, ocean, and coasts. NOAA shares this knowledge with others to conserve and manage coastal and marine ecosystems and resources. NOAA Life for Kids was designed to help you get to know some of our experts here at NOAA. All of our speakers you're gonna hear from today work for some part of the agency. Don't forget to visit our website after the webinar and sign up for the NOAA Live Iron On Patch to commemorate our learning together. And you can also learn about past and upcoming webinars. Today, we are introducing you to the NOAA West Regional Team who will be talking about the winners of NOAA's Picture Climate Change Student Photo Contest. But before we start, we would like to recognize that we're all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional knowledge to share with us. We acknowledge that our speakers today are coming to us from the lands of the Blackfoot Nations in Montana, the Kumash and Barbano Nations in California, the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute Nations in Colorado, and the Hohakam and Upper Pima Nations in Arizona. We're hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Piscataway Indian Nation in Maryland. I also want to extend a thank you to our American Sign Language, Lang Sign Language interpreter, Rhonda. Thanks for being here, Rhonda. A few guidelines before I hand you over to the speakers today. You're all muted. However, there is a box where you can write questions and we encourage you to do that as we go along. If we don't get to your question, don't worry. We'll give you some resources so you can look up the answers on your own after the webinar. We're also going to ask you to answer some questions. So get ready to type. All right, I think I'm all set. So I'm gonna turn it over to today's presenters. Take it away. Hello, my name is Christina Kumler. I work at NOAA in Boulder, Colorado. I work with computers and numbers and weather data, and I combine all of them together to build these things called models. I also happen to be a photographer. I love taking my camera out with me around my town or on vacation. Photos have a way of telling stories and we can take them with all sorts of things like our cell phones or our tablets or small cameras and even big cameras with big lenses. This contest was run in fall of 2021 and NOAA West wanted to ask you students to take pictures from the Western United States that showed us climate change and how we're experiencing climate change in our own communities. Students could use anything like cell phones and tablets and cameras. We've received so many great pictures from students all over the country showing all of their own stories of climate change. And now we're super excited to share the winning photos with you and tell you what NOAA scientists are doing to relate to climate change impacts. Next slide, please. We'll start with this winning photo by Yui, grade 12 in Washington. What can you see in this photo? Are there any human made objects in the photo? What do you notice about the colors? What do you think that means about the photo and when it was taken during the year? I would like to introduce my fellow scientist, Paul, to also talk about this photo. Thanks, Christina. Good afternoon. 
everyone, or good evening wherever you're at. My name is Paul Eniga. I'm a meteorologist. I work at, for the NOAA National Weather Service office in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, we're here looking at these different pictures, talking about climate change. And so Christina and I wanted to discuss this winning photo and get your guys' questions and, and comments on it. So one thing that we look at here, maybe Christina, you think about it too, we think, uh, to me, when I start looking at this photo, something that jumps to mind is change. I mean, it makes sense, right? It was a climate change photo contest, so it was a good picture to, to capture change. And there's a lot of different kinds of change that I see in here. So maybe we can go back and forth a little bit, or we can hear from the students as well as what kind of change they see in there. Um, so I will just pick out one change that I, uh, maybe more subtle one that I see, is that I see the color of the sky maybe changing. So the sun, I'm kind of noticing the position of where the sun is with the clouds. And to me, that that's telling me that the time of day is changing. So this is probably, I'm guessing, in the either early morning or late evening. I'm not quite sure which it is, but that's kind of one one way I see change in this photo. Uh, what about you, Christina? What do you see? Let's see. I really like this word called contrast. And I like how one side of the photo is brighter and more red. And then as we go to the other side of the photo, it seems to get a little bit more dark as something that you might have said, where the sun might be setting or it just might be hitting the trees differently than it's hitting the buildings. I also notice some traffic cones and maybe a building under construction. And that reminds me of change. It doesn't look completed yet. So they're actively building a building in this picture. That's great, Christina and Paul. Thank you so much. Let's hear from some of our attendees. Type in the question box what you see is happening in the photo. We want to hear what you see is going on. I know we showed two. I could probably think of about two or three or four more different kinds of changes that I see going on in there. I'm sure Christina can, can think of that too. So hopefully the uh, students here are picking up on some other kinds of changes they might see. Yeah, so we've got um, Hadley thinks that it's fall. Um, Jasper thinks that the leaves are changing seasonally. And Janet also says that um, it looks like there's a change of season going on. Trevor says that there's a change in weather. So thank you so oh. much. Thank you for those great answers. I think you guys are right that it definitely looks like it's fall with those red leaves and how there are some leaves on the ground. I'm really interested in Trevor's comment because it does look like there is some change of weather. Don't you think so, Paul? Yeah, if we're looking at it, maybe if I'm looking real closely, the road there maybe looks like it's a little wet. So maybe the change, it maybe just rained where, where we're at. Uh, if we're looking at the clouds also, it, it seems like the clouds are transitioning, they're changing um, from maybe rain clouds that had just moved through the area and that the rain had just let up. So now we're kind of going more towards the back end of the storm. Um, definitely agree with the change in the seasons, of course, with the with the trees there. Um, and uh, Christina, you know, you pointed out the building as well. So I think that the big thing here we see is that there's all kinds of change that we have in our communities, right? So there's natural change that happens. So whether it's the climate or the weather or the time, uh, there's the human human change that we see there where we have like buildings and our communities are changing. So if we go uh, to the next slide, I have an example of what that might look like and how that corresponds to some of the work that we do in different parts of NOAA. So these are some satellite images that we got from our friends at NASA. And this is looking at satellite uh, view of Phoenix. So we're up in space and we're looking at down on the Phoenix area and we're seeing how it's growing over several years, over a couple of decades. And you can if you kind of watch, you see all the red areas. The red areas are agricultural farm fields. It used to be a lot of farming in the Phoenix area. It's what it was really known for uh, up until probably the 80s or 90s. Uh, and you can see how the farm fields eventually go away as the city spreads, as the farms uh, are replaced by suburban houses. And so we have this real big expansion of the cities of the metro area. So that's a change that's not natural. That's a change that's because of us, our city's growing. And that can impact our weather. Cities themselves can have a direct impact on the weather. We have the urban heat island which means it gets hotter in the cities during the daytime and especially at nighttime because all the buildings and the roads 
really hold on to that sun's energy through from from the daytime and then release it very slowly at night so it can be much hotter in a city during the nighttime than it is in the surrounding areas and the cities can also impact the weather patterns that go on around them just the wind speeds and directions but also rainfall patterns as well so there's been a lot of research that shows that can happen as well so that's some of the change that we see that goes on uh, from our side even in the weather offices and the things that we do to issue products you know we issue flash flood warnings that's one of the big things we do in my office um, maybe you guys have your own cell phones or mom and dad's cell phones when there's alerts that go on and the and the buzz and you have flash flood warnings or tornado warnings those are people like me in our offices that are doing that as our cities grow and change and the infrastructure change changes that can complicate how the rain how the rain flows through the city and also as our climate is changing the rain is becoming heavier it's becoming more intense from these thunderstorms so that is not a good combination where we're getting more rain in shorter amounts of time on top of these cities that don't drain very well so that can lead to a lot of flooding that happens in cities i know christina if you have more comments we'll go to the next slide too to kind of round out the, the discussion topic on this slide yeah now's a great time to ask us about any questions that you might have either from this picture or the cool satellite image that paul shared I know that when I go outside, sometimes I can feel the heat come off the concrete. So that reminds me of what you were saying, Paul, about the urban heating and how we can have an impact on what we're feeling. Do we have any questions from anybody in the audience? All right, so if you all have any questions about this photo or any questions for Christina and Paul, please type it in the question box before we move on. All right, it doesn't look like we have any questions yet. Oh, maybe we have one. Oh, um, Heidi is asking, what part of the country was that photo taken in? I think it was taken in Washington state. So in the country, that would be in the northwest corner of the country. Awesome. Okay, I think we can move on to the next photo. Great. Right. We'll, we'll transition and we'll, and we'll bring in our friend uh, Andy, who's going to talk about another winning photo and what kind of change it represents. Yeah, thank you so much, Paul. Thank you so much, Christina. You guys did a great job of describing that image. So here, this winning image was from Claire. Claire's in grade seven and from, from Washington. And on the prior image, it was interesting to see that behind the fall foliage was cranes, which are a sign of humans changing the natural environment. These cranes help to create roads and buildings, among other things, which help humans, but at the same infrastructure leads to urban heat islands, like Paul was saying, in densely populated areas. And what these cranes also have to do is they burn fossil fuels, which re release greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, which, for, which further warm the earth. And the warming tests humans, humans and plants and animals' ability to cope with hot temperatures. Well, a little bit about me. My name's Andy Hoyle, and I'm a research meteorologist at the NOAA Physical Sciences Laboratory in Windy, Boulder, Colorado. I research the causes of drought and changing climate, and create drought outlooks for NOAA's partners that focus on food and water security and water availability. This image right here that does an excellent job of showing the effect of extreme heat on plants. The image shows that the plant was once healthy since we can see green areas on its leaves, but the outer part of the leaf has turned brown and wilted because it was stressed by extreme heat and the lack of water in the Northwestern United States where Claire took the image in Washington during the summer of 2021. Now we'd like to ask you all some questions. In this image, what do you see? And what part of the leaf catches your attention?
All right, Sienna says that she uh, notices that the leaf is wilting and is dried out. Jasper says um, where the brown meets the green. That's something that um, they notice. Mm -hmm. Trevor says that it's a dried leaf. So it sounds like it sounds like everyone's um, kind of really understanding this picture, Andrew. Yeah, those are great observations, and I think those are 100% correct. Now, on the next slide, I'll help to explain what caused this poor leaf to wilt. On this slide are three images. The image on the left shows the United States Drought Monitor from May 25th of 2021. The U.S. Drought Monitor is a very useful tool for monitoring drought. The yellow and orange colors indicate moderate drought, while the deep red colors indicate more intense drought. In the northwestern United States, where we see Washington State, the region was experiencing some drought on May 25th of 2021. But since that region is generally cool and wet in the spring, plants like the one in the picture that we saw before are able to grow. The image in the middle of this slide shows the intensity of the heat in June and July of 2021. The deepest red colors in the Northwest United States show that these two months were the hottest on record. The heat was the reason that the plant in the picture that we saw struggled so badly. Studies from our colleagues have indicated that heat we observed in June and July of 2021 could not have happened without human-induced climate change. And then finally, the image on the right shows the United States Drought Monitor from August 3rd of 2021 after the record-breaking heat. The record-breaking heat in June and July caused extreme drought and exceptional drought across the Northwest United States, and that drought led the plants to dry and wilt. Now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Aaron, who will describe this picture. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Aaron Peters. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I am a hydrologist for NOAA's National Weather Service out of Great Falls, Montana. And this photo here that we're gonna look at next was taken by Sophia, who's uh, in grade 10 out of California. <clears throat> And uh, Sophia described this photo as you know, being the product of the area she's from receiving less than half of the precipitation it would, uh, it would normally receive in a year. So uh, what are some of the things you um, notice about this photo? Uh, one of the things I notice uh, right away is that of course there's no water in it, right? Uh, there's no water in the stream bed. Um, and this, the dark, the dark uh, streak there, kind of in the middle, that indicates to me that that's aquatic vegetation that would normally be thriving in a in our stream bed, but it's it's dead because the water is missing. Um, are there any other things that you all uh, notice about this particular photo? Yeah, let's check with the audience. So, what do you all see that could be going on in this photo? You can talk about the color or maybe um, if you think it's hot or cold here. All right, we have got some answers coming in. So, um, we have uh, somebody that's saying there's bank plants that are actually still growing on the side of the photos. Um, we have the trees seem to be very healthy, which tells us that there is a specific precipitation problem. And that is from Claire. Awesome, yeah, those, those are some really great observations. And I wanna kind of touch on both of them. Uh, the fact that there is bank vegetation uh, and maybe not any vegetation, any larger vegetation in the stream bed, that indicates to me that normally there would be water in the stream uh, and that it hasn't gone dry for a long time because, you know, there's no larger vegetation in there. Uh, and then also, you know, the comment about 
uh, that the vegetation on the edges seems to be relatively healthy. It's probably true, uh, and it might be because you know there's not enough wa uh, water to flow in this stream, but there's undoubtedly still some water in the subsurface, still providing moisture uh, for those for those plants. So super awesome uh, uh, observations there. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I'll just chat real quickly, kind of about how uh, the drought uh, that California is experiencing and has been experiencing for some time has really spread through a lot of the West and uh, has affected my work uh, up here in Great Falls, Montana. So we actually are in year two of a pretty significant drought up here. Uh, we saw record coverage of exceptional drought last fall in 2021. And this has led to low water supplies. The plot on the, on the bottom left, you can see uh, that black line is much below normal uh, for one of our state's largest reservoirs. And then our largest river in the state uh, on the bottom right, uh, the Missouri River, is much below normal flow right now. And that's really kind of affecting a lot of places across the West, including California and up here as well. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, move. Oh, yeah, there's an, a question pop up next. So I, I think I might have spoiled this already, but uh, uh, the area that I serve here in Montana is actually the headwaters of the longest river in the United States. So does anybody happen to know what that is? If you didn't catch it before. If you all know what that river is, type it in the chat. We'll see if you were paying attention or not. Yeah. All right, um, Jasper says the Mississippi. We've also got another person that says the Mississippi. So it's, it's, it's a, that's really interesting because it's a pretty common misconception that the Mississippi is the longest river in, in the United States, but the Missouri River is actually just barely slightly longer than the Mississippi. So, uh, and it encompasses a area of over half a million square miles. So it's an enormous area. Um, and it's just barely longer than, than the Mississippi. So that's a little tidbit for you to take take from this. Uh, all right, if we can go to the next slide real quick, I just um, have a, kind of showing like what we can do. So we spent a lot of time characterizing drought and trying to figure out what's going on, right? And that's always kind of difficult because we don't have the data to necessarily do that. Um, but one of the things we're doing uh, because of drought making wildfires worse, uh, which then in turn causes problems for flash flooding and debris flows. Uh, we're trying to characterize those problems from drought by installing some of these uh, remote automated weather stations on burn scars that help us uh, both characterize what causes those events and also help warn the public uh, of any danger that is coming from that. Something else we're working on, and this is being expanded across the Western United States, but uh, I'm focusing on Montana because that's what I know but we're adding 205 new weather stations to our statewide mesonet. And a mesonet is just a collection a network of, of weather stations in the state. Um, we're adding 205 new stations to help us better characterize drought up here. Uh, and so we can go to the next slide and just kind of um, take any questions that anybody might have. Sure, so if you have any questions for Aaron, please put them in the chat. But Aaron, while we're waiting for questions to come in, um, can I ask you to please define burn scars and debris flows? I think that'd be helpful for the audience to know. Sure, I went a little too quickly through that, didn't I? So <laughs> a burn scar is something that happens after a wildfire. So the wildfire burns through and it removes all the, a lot of the green vegetation. And oftentimes it makes the soil uh, what they call hydrophobic. So it, it does not absorb moisture anymore. So uh, when soil doesn't absorb moisture as it should, it causes it to flow over the surface and collect debris as it's going downhill. And on a steep mountainside, it can collect a lot of debris, including big rocks and boulders. And that kind of slurry of mud and rocks and boulders and ash is what we call a debris flow. And it can be very dangerous uh, for folks downstream if they are uh, you know, unaware of its coming. Thanks, Aaron. We do have one question before we move on to the next slide. Um, do you have any plans for these stations in American Samoa? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I think anywhere um, 
anywhere there's a burn scar or a forest fire problem across uh, much of the United States, they are focusing on adding some of these stations. So it's very possible if that's a problem in your area, uh, but I don't know specifically if that is true. All right. And we can, uh, now we'll pass it on to Andy again, who's gonna take over for the next photo. Yeah, thank you so much, Aaron. And yeah, I can't stress enough how important the Missouri River is to the United States in a variety of ways. So thanks for that description. So the last picture and this picture, we see the effect of very little precipitation over a long period of time. This picture was taken by Sienna, a fifth grader from California. And Sienna is here today. Thank you for joining us. It's really a pleasure. This area of California received less than two inches of precipitation over the last five years. That's incredible when you compare that to the rest of the United States. The lack of precipitation has led to no water in the channel in front of us and a very, in very deep crevices in the exposed soil. Paul, what do you see? Yeah, I, and I'd be curious to ask the students here too what they think is going on. Um, and even maybe since we're talking to students from across the country or across the West, they might even guess what part of California this is in as well. Um, this is, to me, this looks like a place that has experienced some extreme change that has happened. Uh, let, let's just pick out a couple of things here. Uh, look at where the house is and, and the, build, the house on the left side and the building on the right side you know they're so far removed from where the water what little water is left there there's a tiny little pond it looks like and, um, you know, this is clearly a community or you know people that had built built they put buildings in a place where there was water at one point but it's just not there anymore it's totally different um, you know it looks like probably 20 feet of water has just disappeared uh, out of that place so um, I'm curious, Kayla, if you're getting any guesses from people on what part of California this might be. Not from Siena. <laughs> well, we don't have um, any guesses on what part of California this might be yet, but we do have some answers coming in um, about what people are seeing in the photo. So Hadley tells us that it seems very dead and sparse. Sandy says that um, there's cracked soil and mud. What else do you see that's going on? Does the place look wet or dry? Do you see people here? Do you know what part of California this might be in? We'll, we'll, we'll keep that one until uh, <laughs> the end. Maybe, uh, I do Andy, have uh, one. Oh, I'm sorry. I do have one more comment. Emma, Wyatt, and Anna say, it looks dry, but isn't that normal for there? Can the basin refill? So maybe we'll save that question um, for just a couple minutes later. Yeah, so I'm curious, the one comment about things looking dead. I don't know, Andy, if you maybe you could take up that uh, that strain and kind of go with a little bit. Yeah, there's a fair bit of struggling vegetation that you can see in the background with those trees. And this ties in with the comment that was made before about isn't this place dry already? That's true. This is a very dry place. But California, and especially Southern California, has been in a prolonged drought for the last 20 years. So indeed, this area has been under drought, despite the fact that it generally receives little precipitation anyways. This area was built up with the expectation of having precipitation and having enough water to fill this channel so that there could be some recreation and unfortunately, that has not been the case. Yeah, so you, you mentioned prolonged drought that's happening too. So, you know, prolonged being a very long stretch of, of time. You know, there's been some recent research that has looked at drought in the Western US. And this is, you know, a hint that this is within the Colorado River Basin. So I believe, um, I don't know offhand, maybe you know offhand, Andy, how many people rely on Colorado River water. I think it's on the order of about 40 million people. Yeah, so, you know, just think about it. there's 40 million people, 40 million of us living across the Southwest that depend on all the rain and snow that fall within the catchment. So within the area of, of land that drains through the Colorado River Valley. So that's a lot of people that depend on this, on this rain. And the drought that we've been going through over the last 20 years or so uh, has proven to be one of the worst droughts 
on record with records going back many hundreds, if not a few thousand years at this point. So it's really ex you know, exceptional what's going on. And you think about how we build our environment for certain types of climate. So that comment earlier that isn't this a dry part of California? Yeah, it's a dry part of California, but it's kind of interesting. You, what you think is dry may not end up being as dry as some place can get. There's a, there is another level to dry that places can see. And that's what's happening here. You had, uh, again, the community, people built, put these buildings here. They had water at one time, but it's it's gotten even drier than when these buildings went up. And so they no longer function as, as we had built them. Right, yeah, the Western United States drought at last estimate from a recent research publication, it showed that this is the worst drought in at least 1200 years. So by far the worst drought that we've experienced at before as we've settled into the United States and North America. And this drought is quite severe in a very long historical context that spans 1200 years. So I think that's the one I was thinking of. So thank you for, for <laughs> specifying a little more on that. Um, I think one other interesting thing to see out here too, like someone had mentioned the, uh, the cracks in the, in the mud there. Um, you know, I'm kind of looking at that and I'm thinking that's a little bit more of an indication that there's still, despite it being so dry, there can be some very intense rain that happens when it does come along because that looks like, like a lot of erosion. So with the rain, the water came, and, and quickly washed out some of the, the sediment that was there. And so even though it's it's a dry place, you can still have these things that happen. It's kind of kind of weird when you think about it. It's a place that's really dry, but when it does rain, it's it's almost like a, a problem when it rains because they just it's hard for the environment, it's hard for our communities to handle that. They're not built to withstand that kind of, of rain. So that's kind of one thing I've seen that, that was kind of interesting. So I'm curious, Kayla, if we got any more guesses as to which part of California. And Andy said Southern California, so he mentioned a little bit there. Yeah, a little hint. Yeah, we do. We have um, a guest from Hadley, uh, Southern California. Um, let's see. And then Hadley says again, Central Valley. So that's what we've got. Okay. Well, it, it, is, it is not the Central Valley. It's not a bad guess. That's also another place that can, can experience some very bad drought and has experienced some really bad drought in the past few years. But this is actually going to be uh, on the Salton Sea, which is in Southeast California. So this is definitely one of the drier parts, not the driest, and I believe the driest would probably be uh, Death Valley. Um, but yeah, like Andy mentioned, this this area usually only sees about two inches of rain a year. And there was, there is a big lake that's there right now, the Salton Sea, but it is changing, it is disappearing as there's less and less water that's going into it. Um, you know, and it's gradually shrinking, which is, bringing about additional environmental hazards. Because if you think about all the, there's a lot of agriculture, a lot of farm fields around there. And there's a lot of things that, you know, pesticides and whatnot that farmers put on their crops to, to help produce uh, healthy vegetables and whatnot. But all that stuff eventually runs, runs down with, when it does rain and it goes into the Salton Sea. The Salton Sea is a big catch for this area. So it's not exactly the, the healthiest water that's there. It has very high salinity. There's a lot of salt in there. So it's very difficult for any kind of fish or aquatic life to live in there. Um, but as the sea is, is it shrinking, as this lake is shrinking, more and more of the beach is getting exposed. And when it gets windy, it picks that up and there can be a lot of health hazards that come along with that. So there's a lot of people that have asthma and other respiratory issues. And it's becoming really problematic in that part of California. And it's not just going to be California that sees that either. It can the when the wind picks this stuff up, it can blow it for many hundreds of miles. So it's it's kind of one of these slow moving environmental disasters, you know, that people have been trying to figure out what to do. So. All right. So Paul and Andy, we do have a question for you. Heidi asks, is that farm equipment that we're kind of seeing out in the distance there? Let me put on my binoculars. Uh, <laughs> I don't see farm equipment, but then again, you may be on a bigger screen than I am. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it is. I'm. I'm kind of seeing maybe it's like an RV or something like that. So I don't. You know, if you if you guys go and look at Google Maps or something, and you can find the Salton Sea, and you can very easily pick out where there's farm fields and where there's not. It's it's kind of interesting because it's either 
desolate desert like you see here in this picture or it's very lush uh, things that are growing out there like lettuce and carrots or whatnot that they, that they grow there so um, but yeah it used to be it's a very interesting place the, the history of this area too of the Salton Sea used to have a big resort and people would go there and go boating and water skiing and all sorts of interesting stuff in the, about 50 years ago and as the water has slowly gone away all that stuff has disappeared people can't really do that stuff anymore yeah. all right well we don't have any other questions coming in for this photo so i think we can transition yeah we'll transition to christina once again and she'll describe the next image yeah so paul do you want to start off explaining maybe what you see in the image and then while paul is talking about what he sees everybody else can think about what they're seeing in the sky or with the grasses and think about how the photo makes them feel and what story maybe this photo is telling yeah i don't, I don't want to get uh give away too much what I see and I want to, want to hear from the students what you you all are seeing um, there's a lot of things to notice in here um, maybe just one thing I see here right away is that it, you have the mountains in the distance which is kind of interesting I, I, I think a lot of us if we're in the west we live in a place where there's mountains not too far away we can probably look outside the window and and see mountains um, that's right you? Dominic took this photo in Colorado and I pitch it back to you Christina what you with something you pick out of here. Or we hear from Kayla what the students are seeing. Too. Yeah, Kayla, what are the students saying? Sure, so we don't have any comments coming in yet. So you all, what do you see in this photo? What's happening in the sky? How do you feel when you look at this photo? All right, so we've got some answers coming in now. We have Sienna says that she notices the grass is a reddish color, um, but maybe that's because of the sunset. So something to keep in mind. Hadley says the grasses seem dry. Claire says um, it looks like the sun is either setting or rising and it's heating everything a lot. The color of the grass looks like it's dying, which is added to by the sun glares. It looks like there's a truck in the background. Very, very like, great observations here. Chris says, is that smoke in the sky or a fire? Oh, I'm sorry, that was Linnea. And Emma says, what's with that van? Is it a windmill? So lots of great observations going on here. Yeah, you guys are really good at observations. What I notice in this photo is something that I have seen many afternoons and evenings because I also live in Colorado and it looks like a smoky sunset scene. I can't answer if that is a van or a wind turbine in the back it does look like a tall turbine figure but i think the general feeling in this photo is that it's a really smoky sunset night what do you think paul i i was also very curious about the van slash windmill but i, I don't know if the van if it's a van that's just parked in front of the windmill it's a it's interesting, but yeah, the, the smoke is obviously something that catches your eye and and kind of looking at where the smoke is. It's not down, it's not down close to the ground. It's really high up in the sky. So what that tells me is that there there's obviously a fire going on somewhere, but it's going to be much further away because there's been time for the smoke to go up into the into the atmosphere and travel a much further distance. So it's kind of a good example of how something can go on far away from you but still impact you where you are because the smoke can travel very far and i think christina you had some examples of how smoke can travel across the country yeah let's go to the next slide please so check out these two pictures these are taken now not from the grounds like the photo we just saw but from way up high from satellites that look over the united states the continental united states and what can you notice in these two images can you spot any differences in the clouds is there a difference between the smoke and the clouds and if so can you explain what you're seeing that's a great question, Christina. So 
everyone that's listening here, take a look at these two satellite photos and uh, let us know what you see. Is there a difference between the photos? Adley says that there isn't a lot of green or plant life. Yeah, when we start to look at the earth from way high up, it's really hard to pick out individual trees and plant life. In this image on the top of the slide, you have the entire Pacific coast of the United States. So it might be tricky to see, but there's California and Oregon and Washington, and then even our neighbors, Canada. And as you go more and more north, you can see a little bit more green. And that is probably because they receive a little bit more rain throughout the entire year. So they tend to be greener and that's easier to see from the satellite. Whereas the further south you go, it looks drier. What I notice in that image is that there's a lot of brown colored clouds and then white colored clouds that look like they go over the blue ocean and those brownish colored clouds are actually all wildfire smoke from the different wildfires on that west coast and then because i live in colorado and the photo was taken in colorado we did a close-up video on one of colorado's wildfires where there were clouds on one side of colorado but then if you look super, super close, you might see the smoke and the plume that we call a plume go above those clouds and move east. Now, Kayla, if you don't mind going to the next slide, please. Sure. I just really quickly wanted to say we have some more comments coming in about these satellite, um, these satellite images. So Sienna said, um, in one of the pictures on the right, it looks like a factory putting out carbon dioxide. Um, and finally, oh, she meant, let's see, um, there are more clouds and smoke in the bottom image, says Claire. And finally, Hadley says, it seems that dust and smoke are mixed with clouds. So just wanted to let you know that we've got some great observations here. These are fantastic observations. You're right. And when the plume, the, the smoke, when it rises from the fire like that, it can look very similar to factory smoke. Good comparison. So our NOAA scientists are working really hard to help both firefighters when they're on the ground trying to put out and control these fires as well as to try and help forecast or explain where the smoke travels to. Because as Paul said before, you can have smoke on the ground, but you can also have smoke get higher and higher in the sky, and then that can move away from where the fire is. So sometimes people who live really far away can still see smoke from fires that are states and states away from them. And at NOAA, we try to help, and I try to help, improve our understanding and forecast so that you know when it's healthier or less healthy to go outside and play and breathe that smoke because it's not good for us to breathe. And I know Paul works with some of these meteorologists who are in the field and help the firefighters. Do you want to speak on that, Paul? Yeah, you see, I mean, we have two different ways, many different ways of helping when it comes to wildfires, like what Christina was just talking about. One of the ways that meteorologists from NOAA can help is like the picture you see here, we have what are called incident meteorologists, or what we call IMETs. And if a fire gets big enough, they, the fire agencies can, can call up NOAA and say, hey, we need a meteorologist to help us out. And we have specially trained people that will, within 12 hours usually, hop on a plane or hop in the car and they take all their equipment and they are there and they're ready to help out. And so they do on-site forecasting. So they, they get to learn exactly what's going on with the fire, where is it burning, and what kind of resources are out there. And then they can get very specific forecasts to try to help uh, help the firefighters manage and, and get that fire out quicker. So it's a very, a very big program. And just like you would think with all the increase in fires that have been going on in the past, you know, 10, 20 years, that this has become even more important to get these IMETs out there on the field and help. So 
it's a very uh, interesting way. It's not all, all of NOAA meteorologists that do that. It's a very small subset. I think that there's only about, uh, if I if I had to think, maybe like 70 or 80 people in the, in the NOAA that does this, it's not a big group. So it's a pretty specialized group of people that, that get to do this and go out there. So they might be on a fire. They, they, they can only go out to a fire for up to two weeks at a time, but sometimes they're out there for the full two weeks. And those are usually really long days that they're working. You know, they start working at maybe four or five in the morning and they're working until eight or nine o'clock at night. So that's all, all they do when they're out there is deal with this fire. Yeah, thank you for that information, Paul. We have to move on to our final winner, but before we go, does anybody have any questions? All right, everybody, before we move on to the last photo, do you have any questions for Paul and Christina? We learned a lot about smoke and satellite images and people that it's their job to actually go out and you know monitor these fires. Do you have any questions? Um, Hadley ask, asks, is that, was that photo taken on a farm? Hadley, I do not know if we have the answer to that question because Dominic took the photo. Living in Boulder, Colorado, I would say it could be anywhere. Uh, we have a lot of open fields that pass next to roads, but it is a good guess that it might be a farm. One more question before we move on. Um, Okay, Hadley says thank you. And we just have a comment from Jasper that says there was a NOAA Live last year with one of the field meteorologists talking about their fireworks. So Jasper, it seems like you you might have listened to one or two of these webinars and thank you for being here. And I think that is all the questions for this photo. Thanks, Paul and Christina. Thanks, and we're going to pass it now to Ryan, who's going to talk about more impacts that smoke can have in fires. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Ryan Friedman. Uh, I work off of the coast of California, and um, this is a really neat photo that spoke to me. And one of the things that um, we've talked a lot in this session about fire and how fire and heat are really impacting the places on land where people live and really get to see its effects. I'm a marine biologist and I work in the water. So this is something that really speaks to me, especially as you kind of see this blending of I think these things come together. Are you guys losing me? Sorry, oh, my video just cut. Um, yes, we are. And, uh, it looks like you're back I now. I work on a lot of animals that um, get affected. Oh, sorry. Um, I, wor um, I work on a lot of animals that are also affected by heat. Um, in a way that sometimes we don't think about it because we think of the water, especially the Pacific Ocean, as being very cold. Um, so seeing this kind of contrast where we're seeing these air impacts and these heat impacts kind of intersect with this coastal landscape and the water is something that's, I think, almost lost when we talk about climate change. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what you guys are seeing in this photo. For me, it's kind of seeing this really neat color scheme through the water and the sky and seeing how there's an impact collage almost of all these different ecosystems that are feeling the impact of climate change. So I'm wondering what you guys are seeing in this photo and we can talk about it. Awesome. So Ryan, it looks like we have some chats coming in. Um, Hadley says, well, let me just make sure I'm seeing everything correctly. Okay. So We've got, um, they notice that the horizon is a smoky dark gray color. Mm -hmm. um, Hadley see, or Janet says um, that there might be smog. Hadley says that um, they see either burned wood or trash and the sun reflects off the water. And they also see little shore birds. Sandy says um, that they see invasive grass and a fire sky. Yeah. Anna says, neat colors with the plants, beach, and gray sky. So a lot of descriptive language here. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, 
the colors are really interesting. And I think down there, we're actually looking at rocks and not burned objects. Um, the coast of the Pacific coast is very rocky. So we can, um, that's where a lot of animals live. But this extreme smoke um, uh, that we're seeing in the picture, which there is smog, especially in Southern California, but this is a, a big fire sky. And fire and smoke get into the water. The particles cause these plankton blooms, which can be problematic for a lot of animals downstream because they create these toxins in the environment that um, accumulate up in predators and can make them very sick. Um, but also one of the things that um, affects the water is we actually have heat waves in the ocean, very similar to the heat waves we discussed um, in prior slides. Um, can I move to the next one? Um, and one of the things we had in 2014 is we had a big heat wave that affected the water here. So this is looking at the Southern California Bight. Um, Santa Barbara, where I work, is sort of at the um, right where that turn is from when it goes south to north to east to west. And you can see July 20, uh, 2003 is what we would call a typical year. So we have this big change in water. The red water is water above 17 degrees Celsius. And then as you get into cooler colors, um, it, the water gets colder. So we have this kind of big change as these two currents meet. The Davidson comes from the south all the way from Mexico, and we have the California current that runs all the way from Alaska down the coastline. And so it creates this really cool transition zone in this area, and which creates these high biodiversity places. There's lots of different species of fish, of sharks, of mammals, and it creates a really neat ecosystem that we get to study. However, in 2014, we had a marine heat wave, which is sometimes called the blob, and it created this, these conditions that basically made everything super warm. And that really changed how the ecosystem looked. Just as we saw in the photo, it caused this like homogenization. There's just one color. The heat made everything look pretty similar. And we have an example from Santa Barbara Island, which is one of the islands I work for the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. We protect a number of different places around the country. And my home sanctuary is the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. So we protect a number of islands off the coast of California. And I have a, in my next slide shows two pictures we have from that area. I do a lot of diving um, in, the, in that habitat and it's known for its super lush kelp forest. So if we can move to the next slide. Thanks, Ryan. I wanted to quickly point out here um, that um, the difference between the ocean and the land. So is it true that the ocean is the red colors and then the land is the gray? In this case, you've seen a lot of satellite images that show colors moving over the land. But this satellite image is actually showing information from the water. So typically when we do that, we gray out the land so you know when you're looking at ocean versus the land. So in this case, the coastline is the land. You can see a couple of black um, marks in there. Those are islands that just aren't filled in, but all the color would be seawater. All right. So this is showing, as I said before, two images that I took um, while diving in the exact same spot. You can see the healthy kelp forest on the left was during one of these normal years where kelp's growing and it's super abundant and kelp's an important um, ecosystem builder, sort of like trees in a forest, right? So when you have lots of a healthy forest, lots of animals can be there, lots of plants can grow. They're, they're really foundational to making that habitat. And when the heat wave came in 2014, it was just too hot for kelp to grow. We even saw kelp melting like the tissue falling apart and we get these barrens um, partly because of it, it's too hot and then also because um, the super warm water caused a boom in the urchin population so the urchins look like spiky little balls and they roll across the bottom of the seafloor and they chew up the kelp and that's what they eat um, and so we get these kind of barrens where these healthy kelp forests used to be and that really has problematic effects um, for the kelp forest ecosystem the good news is that there's something we can do about it. Um, by putting in these protected areas, um, we were actually able to see that when we designate MPAs and special protected areas, it actually helps kelp remain and grow back faster after these heat wave events. So it's not, we can do things on local levels to combat the climate change that you guys are all taking really cool and neat photos of. So it's important to get involved and think about how you can eliminate impacts that might affect with climate change. So make sure that your beaches are clean, pick up garbage after yourself, uh, do what you can to take care of your local environment and that'll help uh, keep the environment healthy and stable and resilient to when these big heat impacts come. 
And those important things is we all can do our part to eliminate local effects that would make our ecosystem stronger in the face of climate change. So I'll take any questions you guys have now. Hadley is asking, where is that in California? I actually don't have the answer to that if, if someone on the thing does. Let's see. Um, Hadley, we might be able to get you that answer in just a moment. But um, before we move on, do you, does anyone have any questions for Ryan about you know, the kelp forest and his, um, his diving experience or about this photo here? Hadley is asking, is diving cold in the area that you're at? Yeah, so I just went diving last week and it was 51 degrees in the water, which to give people a sense, um, when you dive in such cold water, some people, myself included, get what's called an ice cream cone headache, where the water's so cold it makes all of the uh, tissue in your head tense up. So it gives you a really, really bad like migraine headache, um, which is uh, not a fun experience. It's definitely way different. You have to wear a lot of neoprene. Some people wear dry suits. Got to wear a lot of stuff to keep you warm when you dive in California. It's definitely different than the Gulf or Hawaii or any tropical place. That sounds really cold, Ryan. I do have um, a comment here from Claire, um, and they say there's a huge difference in the temperature of the water, and that must hugely affect marine animals. Um, uh, the differences between the that we see in like that normal year that transition yes we see totally different communities on either side of that transition and when we see that shift when these heat waves come a lot of those animals are living on the edge of what they can live at so um, even small changes in temperature is really going to change what this area looks like and um, that puts it at real risk from climate impacts and real risk from when even these extreme impacts come because we see new animals come in. Actually, we found after the heat wave our first seahorses in our in these eelgrass beds that have never been here before. So our animals, because they're living at their range limits, are going to be really affected um, because we're at this small temperature shift range. Awesome. And um Hadley, to answer your question about where it was in California, it was in McKinleyville, California. And super quickly, Ryan, before we close up out the webinar, um, Andrew wants to know, what is the deepest depth you've ever dove? Um, I've only been to 160 feet, which is pretty deep only. for dive. <laughs> um, but uh, there's definitely people that have super deep records beyond that. Um, yeah, but it's um, a lot of the work I do is in super shallow. Well, we I say shallow, but um, above 80 feet is where I do a lot of my work. Um, there are people that go down to mesophoto briefs and these super deep ecosystems, and that diving gets really intense and different. You need a lot of special training to do that. But there are no divers that do. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Oh, here we go. So um, I'm hoping that this, um, being able to share all these photos with you and talking to all these NOAA scientists um, really inspire you to look into the communities in your backyard. Climate, as you've seen, affects all the way from the ocean, all the way to the mountains, to the Great Plains, to the Pacific Northwest. And we really am hoping that this inspires you to go look at climate change in your own world, in your backyards, in the communities you live in, because we, we're gonna see those changes. So be present and try and take stock of what's changing and what you can do to help and mitigate that change. Um, share your story with us, with other people. Um, you can be with or without a camera. Um, photos are a great medium to talk about these changes, but they're not the only way. So be sure to be present and think about it and talk with other people in your community about what you're seeing um, in the climate and as climate changes. and uh is predicted to going to change and be curious so stay positive look for ways you can help and keep trying to learn about how the climate change is going to affect not only your community but everyone as a whole in the u.s and in the world so be present and curious about those impacts and be ready to learn um, there's we're all going to need you guys in the future to help us make a better planet so we can do some of the work here but it's really on all of us together to work as a team 
and look for some solutions to these problems. And some of our best ideas come from the public. So please be curious and be ready to help us. Thank you so much, Ryan. And thank you to everybody on the NOAA West regional team for your amazing talk. Um, I also wanna say thank you to everybody who submitted photos to the photo contest. A special congratulations to the winners of the photo contest. Um, I think we all learned a lot and we can share our new knowledge with friends and family. So this concludes today's webinar, but please stay tuned for a post webinar survey. We would love your feedback. And um, that's where you'll also get more information on past and upcoming webinars. So I'm gonna jump off here, but I'd love all of the scientists to jump on and say goodbye to all of the attendees that were here today. All right, thanks everybody. Have a good one. Thank you. Thanks guys.